Over the last five years, the technology industry has spent $1.2 billion on trying to solve one problem, not on self-driving cars, not on Uber's reputation, maybe, maybe, <laughs> not on whether or not to delete Trump's Twitter account. They've spent $1.2 billion on trying to solve diversity and technology. We've all seen the stories in the news like this. And in five years, not much has changed. In fact, this recent study says things are actually getting worse. So how are we going to solve this problem? We all know it's good for the bottom line. We know it's not good for innovation. And we know it's not good for our country. But don't worry, I have the answer. And it's one word, lesbians. <laughs> Lesbians always have the answer. <laughs> it's true. Even BuzzFeed agrees. They said, if tech were more like Lesbian 2 Tech, technology would be a better place. And it's because we've created a community of over 30,000 queer women and the people who love them. We've created a diverse culture and community, one where women can build rocket ships, cure cancer, and they can also hula hoop and give high fives all day long. In fact, we love high fives so much, I want you to turn to your neighbor, give them a high five. <laughs> Feels good, I promise. <laughs> right? <laughs> Congratulations. You are now officially a part of the Lesbian 2 Tech community. <laughs> it's that easy. We've already solved diversity. Um, before I started Lesbian 2 Tech, I grew up in a fairly conservative home, very religious. I actually thought all gay people lived in San Francisco, <laughs> which is even funnier because not too long after I realized I was gay, I in fact did move to San Francisco <laughs> to work for an LGBT or organization that was fighting for marriage equality in California. And it was there I fell in love with data and the power of technology. I taught myself how to build online fundraising tools and ended up raising millions of dollars but it's also where I realized that women were missing. We were missing from the conversation. We were missing from, from the tables where decisions were being made. Even though LGBTQ women represent 50% of the population, our power did not reflect that. And every LGBT event I went to looked a lot like this. <laughs> and then years later, I started my own technology company. And every single event <laughs> looked like this. And I started to wonder, do lesbians in tech actually exist. <laughs> I wasn't sure. Because everywhere I turned, lesbian spaces were dying, bars were closing, publications were going out of business, every gay neighborhood in America is catered mostly to gay men. And if you think about it from an economic perspective, it makes a lot of sense. Sadly, women still make less than men, so when you put two women together versus two gay men, we're actually opposite ends of the economic spectrum. And this is obviously more stark for people of color and the transgender community. And it was my time working in San Francisco that I realized the most single important lesson of my life. There are only two ways that you can show up in this world, and that's with your time and your money. And your money is a lot more scalable. And I made a decision at that moment that I wanted to be a lesbian who had a voice, who had a seat at the table. I wanted to be a queer woman who wasn't afraid to use both my time and money to create the world I wanted to live in. And let me be clear, I want to live in a world where women make more money than men. <laughs> I want to live in a world where no one can lose their job because of their sexuality or gender identity. I want to live in a world where transgender women of color are not being murdered. where Congress actually reflects the people that live in this country. <laughs> where 10-page papers arguing the gender gap exists because women are more neurotic and have a lower stress tolerance than men do not exist. <laughs> and I want to live in a world where there is a black lesbian president. 
And sure, we're talking about diversity in tech, but our industry is a microcosm and a reflection of the greater society. So how are we going to solve this problem? I think we have to do things 10% differently. And I told you lesbians have the answer, so here's how we did it at Lesbians Do Tech. Lesson number one, we have to show up. I know this sounds simple, but we have to show up for the things that we care about. We have to show up with both our time and our money, even if it means showing up to spaces that are uncomfortable. One of our executives told me, you know, Leanne, I love Lesbians Who Tech because everyone there is slightly uncomfortable. It's not often that I share spaces, queer spaces, with my coworkers, people I manage, my boss. And I realized it's that tinge of difference that allows us to let our guard down, maybe laugh a little more, and really connect with the people around us. And it's in those moments that learning happens, learning that leads to change, leads to shifting hearts and minds, and ultimately leads to culture change. Or when Mark Benioff, the CEO of Salesforce, showed up, I got so many emails from employees who said, I cannot tell you how much it means to me to have my CEO show up for who I really am. One of my favorite ways to show up is to give first. A few years ago, the White House, the Obama White House, um, emailed and said, will you help us put on an LGBTQ tech and innovation summit? I, of course, said yes. And one of the first things I did was email Megan Smith, who was uh, a VP at Google at the time, and I asked her to speak. She said yes, and it was there at that event that she got recruited to be the chief technology officer of the United States. The White House gave first, and out of it, they got a more than qualified candidate. Step two, I do not believe we can solve this problem fast enough or at all without implementing quotas. Because what gets measured is more likely to get done, period. The first year of Lesbian 2 Tech, we didn't see the representation among women of color that we wanted to, so I implemented a quota, 50% women of color. And guess what? Ever since then, every summit we've had, has been 50% women of color. And sure, it's meant having some awkward conversations with very important white women who really wanted to speak, or with companies who said, but Leanne, we can't find any women of color speakers. I said, try harder. <laughs> it's in those moments, while slightly uncomfortable, that change happens. Since then, we've implemented two new quotas, 10% transgender and gender nonconforming, 20% black and Latinx, and again, we've been able to do that ever since we implemented those quotas. And make no mistake, the second I stop focusing on this with intention, measuring that attention with data, it starts to drop. Because things don't magically change. That's not how the world works. Things only change when we create urgency, and quotas create that urgency. For example, it's going to take another 170 years for women to reach pay equity with men at our current rate. What if we implement quotas? Because I don't know about you, but I don't have 170 years to wait. The reality is we live in a sexist, racist, and anti-LGBTQ world. It's all around us. We can actually never fully remove our bias, no matter how many unconscious bias trainings we take, which is why we have to fight it every single day, and quotas help us do that. And sadly, the world is not fair. It's really not fair. Today, we can predict how much money you will make over the course of your lifetime with almost exact accuracy based on the zip code that you were born in. Does that sound fair? Silicon Valley loves to pretend that we live in this meritocracy. But if that's true, that's not the world that I want to live in. I tell them often, you know, just because we love hoodies and jeans doesn't mean that we live in this fair world. And quotas do not lower the standard. A few countries like Norway and Spain have started to implement the number of women on corporate boards. And what they've seen is that not only does it work, but it changes the criteria. Lesbian 2 Tech, over the last five years, has not only been able to hit 50% women of color speakers, but because we've been able to hit so much trust in our community, we've been able to have 40% color women of color attendees. There's no way we would have done this without quotas, without tracking them with data, and thinking about representation from the very beginning. Which brings me to my next point. It's so important to think about representation from the beginning. Nothing matters more than your founding team or your first few hires. It affects your culture. It affects the type of people you attract to work at your company. It affects the very product that you are building. So before you start a company with your four best friends who happen to be white and all went to the same school, ask yourself, is this the right leadership team? 
Do we reflect the people who will be using our product? We have to start thinking about this 10% differently. Even though technology is about innovation and risk, pushing our limits, hiring is actually about the opposite. It's about eliminating the risk. And tech companies have decided the safest way to hire is through direct referrals and hiring from the same five schools that every other tech company hires from. And assuming that we can't change this hiring practice, how can we scale access to direct referrals outside of our own bias networks? I believe in this idea so much that we actually built a tool called Include, and it actually connects underrepresented technologists with mentors who can validate their skills, ultimately giving them access to that direct referral they need to get the job they deserve so companies can build their best team. And this is especially important when we're thinking about non-traditional talent, which is the future. Right now, 60% of all technical people in this country are getting their education through online courses and coding boot camps. But there's so much bias for people who do not have computer science degrees. And when you're thinking about representation, I want you to think about it from an intersectional approach. What I'm about to say might blow your mind. Lesbians are women. <laughs> You'd be surprised how many conversations I had in the very beginning. They said, Leanne, you know, we love what you're doing, but right now we're focused on increasing women in tech. <laughs> I said, this is going to be awkward for a second. But lesbians are women. We're also women of color. We're transgender women. We're veterans. We're mothers. People have so many identities. The last step, we have to question our assumptions. We can't just keep blaming Pipeline. When I started Lesbian 2 Tech, I 100% thought it would fail. Because I, when I looked around, there weren't any queer women. But it's not because there wasn't Pipeline, and it's not because we didn't exist. It's because we weren't providing the right type of value, the value that LGBTQ women wanted. So before you blame Pipeline, ask yourself, have we tried to do things differently? Are we offering incentives for diverse talent? Have we implemented quotas? Have we made this an urgent enough problem at our company? Have we tried to hire outside of San Francisco and New York? Because American talent lives everywhere. Coal miners are actually teaching themselves how to code in Kentucky. What if we hired from Kentucky? What if we opened offices in Kentucky or the middle of the country? I want to be clear, even though diversity is very important, this is about more than diversity. Because right now, the average tech salary is almost three times the average American salary. This is about more than diversity. This is about including everyone, including all Americans. This is about economic opportunity for everyone. Think about how this can change not only one life, but a family, a community. How we can solve this problem in our country. Because this isn't just about making an industry more successful, although it will. This is about making our country the best that we can be. So who's going to solve this billion-dollar problem? Who's going to be the first company to do it? Google, are you going to make diversity a moonshot? Amazon, are you going to implement a hiring quota when you move HQ2 to Washington, DC? <laughs> Facebook, instead of one person of color on a board, why not implement a quota of 50% women and people of color? When I look back at how Lesbian Stack has been so successful, it's not rocket science. We've just done things 10% differently. What if we're just 10% away from solving this billion-dollar problem? What if we're just 10% away from a world where there can be a black lesbian president? Thank you. <laughs>